Hello and welcome to another episode of this very special series, My Friend Money. Our guest today is uh, not only a veteran in the whole money management industry, he's been managing equities for around uh, 15 years now, but also he's a very successful author and we all know him very well for his stock picking style. Saurabh Mukherjee, who is the CEO of Marcellus Capital, joins me today for this episode. Hi Saurabh. Hi, very hi. Hi, so everyone, uh, uh, most of you are familiar with Saurabh Mukherjee for the kind of uh, stock picking um, advice that he gives. Uh, he's known for the books he's written as well, the latest one being uh, Coffee Can Investing. Yeah. And uh, uh, while Saurabh is a veteran at this, uh, what we are going to talk to him about today is his own relationship with his personal finances, his money relationship. So sort of, uh, I don't know if you've done this before and have spoken to anybody about this, this before. Uh, but uh, let's begin with where uh, it all started. Right. You are an economics graduate. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've done, I think, your post-graduation also in the yeah, same uh, right. field. So uh, do you bring in that kind of balance? Uh, did you know, should we assume that you knew what to do with your money right from the start, from your first salary? No, I think you chose a very good topic. I guess most of us struggle to deal with our own investments rationally. And in my case, uh, uh, the money came before economics came. Okay. So it's even harder <laughs> still. So uh, I remember I was 15. My parents migrated to the UK when, when I was uh, 15. Okay. And initially, the initial years were very difficult for us financially. So I took up a job um, after school uh, when I was 15. And, um, and I used to deliver newspapers in the afternoon. Um, so, so that was basically, uh, they, they didn't have pocket money for me, so my pocket money came from uh, delivering newspapers. What did you do with your pocket money? So, so initially, the initial investments, uh, so to speak, were in music cassettes, in those days we used to have cassettes. Very good investment. <laughs> um, and and yeah. then I realized that rather than buying the cassette, I could go to the local library in the suburb of London where we lived in, and I could borrow the cassette. Oh, okay. And true Indian style, copy the cassette oh, rather than oh, spend wow. the money okay. on the cassette. Yeah. Ironically, that's how I started buying books. Uh, and then I realized why buy the book? You can go to the library. Yeah. Um, so then I had a little bit of money so left over. That's how my first savings account. I think I my first savings account when I was 16. Um, so, so, the, the so did your parents set, sort of nudge you into it or did you have? I mean, you could say that they nudge me into it in so far as they said, look, we don't have any money to give you for pocket money. Okay. You figure it out by yourself. Okay. So uh, the savings account came on my own because I figured that uh, rather than the few pounds that I earned from delivering newspapers uh, lying in my uh, in my piggy bank, mm -hmm. I could actually earn some interest. In those days in the UK, you, would, you got 4 or 5% interest, mm -hmm. which to me felt like a very generous uh, return. Mm -hmm. uh, so the first savings account came at 16. And then I remember the first um, capex, so mm. to speak, with uh, accumulation of savings mm. was um, when I finished school and I wanted to travel. Um, right. I wanted to travel for uh, three or four months. Again, my parents couldn't finance it. Mm. So I, um, I'd been working through my school uh, school years. When I, when I finished school, I also took up a job in a mm. betting shop as a, wow. as a as a betting shop cashier. So mm. come, you would come and say, I'm going to bet on that cricket match and football match. I would do the odds. And, figure out how much okay. money to charge and then all of that money went on financing a trip around Europe on a back backpacking trip so that That's was good. the first capex that blew out my my accumulated savings over two years uh, but that was my first experience money after that I went to the LSE to become an economist so money came for, for economics but that's uh, excellent. Your initial investments have been like, very good. Music, books, and travel. travel yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> what more do you want? You should just stop there yeah. and you know, like... Uh, because my wife puts yeah. it, those still remain. The only investments <laughs> I make. Um, yeah. But I think where where uh, the sort of most, the, the more serious money came after graduation. Uh, by that time, through my college years, I'd read the sort of the policy of putting money Mm. In, um, in in actively managed mutual funds. So I read John Vogel through my college years. I read the efficient market hypothesis. Right. By the time I graduated, I had a very healthy synthesis of, of mutual fund managers, and and therefore uh, I, I promised myself I would never put money in an actively managed mutual fund. I didn't know enough about markets to do stock picking myself mm. or to say I will time this cycle or that cycle. Mm. So remember, after college, the first bu bunch of savings. Um, mm went into um, tax free government bonds mm -hmm. uh, and, and it went into tracker funds. Okay. So, so this is I graduated in 98. Tracker funds are like passive funds? Passive funds, okay. right. And I chose uh, most, I, I looked up the cheapest 
fund in the UK mm -hmm. in terms of fund management charges, and I invested there. Mm -hmm. um, this was '98. Um, you know, I was, I was working as an economist uh, in London, and and you know, even in those years, basic years, I could see people were a little overexcited about the stock market. So so through '98, '99, I did a fair bit of government bond, uh, 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 government bond investing. Uh, uh, there's tax-free government bonds even in the UK. And I did that in a tax-free wrapper. So you, the, the UK government gives you a certain allowance per year right. that you put in government bonds tax-free. So I did that. Right. And then I remember uh, when 9-11 happened, mm -hmm. I thought this is a great time to to, uh, do, to load up on equities. So I absolutely uh, emptied my tax-free government bonds after 9-11, again to buy equity tracker funds. And mm -hmm. I bought, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I remember I bought global equity MSCI World Equity Tracker mm. um, after 9-11. Um, that corpus that I built up by 2004 was actually used to see my first company. I found co-founded a firm called Kill Capital mm. in 2004. And the seed money from that came from those uh, six years mm. of saving by, partly through tax-free government bonds and partly through tracker funds. Right? Wow. I hadn't yet made an active investment and I hadn't yet chosen a fund manager. Mm -hmm. I was very much a Jack Bogle fan mm -hmm. that active fund managers are, are not going to be able to make sort of money. We'll come to that right. in a bit. But clearly what I'm sensing is that you've been very conscious and aware about money right from the start. Yeah, yeah. If you grow up in a house without much money. Deprivation. Yeah, <laughs> I always yeah. say deprived yeah. and you, you know when you say the... So you realize the value of earning even 10 pounds a week from delivering right. newspapers. You realize the value of earning 20 pounds a week from being a cashier mm -hmm. in a betting shop. Um, so have you been conservative always about where you spend your money? Have you done big spends that you've later regretted? So not really, as you know, as, as, you, as we just discussed, right? I'm not really a person who's got any great uh, spending needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I spend most of my time reading, listening to music and, and traveling, mm -hmm. whatever's left uh, my life says I spent on the family. <laughs> um, but where I think like everybody else, I've made some mistakes is after I moved to India, mm -hmm. Uh, I made mistakes on investments. I think our country is a particularly uh, fraught environment. I think you're mm -hmm. surrounded by people who are there to sell to you. And it's okay. a lethal environment mm -hmm. for, for even for affluent people like you and me. It's a lethal environment just to save money. And I think like a lot of people, my, my biggest investment in, uh, investment mistake was ULIPS. I, right. uh, wow. I bought insurance products. Wow. With, One wouldn't have thought. <laughs> with, yeah. So, yeah. so in fact, it was, it was so embarrassing that to make the mistake and I, I remember within two years of making the mis investment mm -hmm. I realized it was a mistake mm -hmm. but you know as, as we're all human beings you don't want to sort of admit to yourself mm -hmm. um, it took me another two years to admit to my wife that this was a mistake that I had you know wasted some of our savings so you didn't tell her initially or that it was a mistake was so, you so didn't were, admit I, it I remember she sat in on the meeting with the financial advisor who mm -hmm. Convinced right. us that this blend of insurance and investing is a good idea. Right. She sat in on the meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I remember being a little uh, ambiguous about it in my head, but then mm -hmm. on the blend, I thought, well, it's a good idea to have a life insurance policy for my family if something happens to me. Plus, hey, it's an investment vehicle. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I got swayed. She didn't demur then. Mm -hmm. After a couple of years of looking at the maths, I realized this is a crap yes. product, right? Mm -hmm. But by that time, you sort of Mentally, mentally committed to it. The first year commissions, as you know, it's very uh, hard to let go of what you've already right. paid. The first year premium, premium you've paid yeah. has been used yeah. to pay commissions to the intermediary. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it took me another couple of years to admit to my wife, another couple of years to unwind the, the mistake. And Is it a mental struggle to do this? Yes, yeah, so I think you where you struggle with it is firstly, you know, you firstly struggle to admit to yourself. It's a mistake. Yeah, it's right. Then you struggle to uh, deal with the sunk cost element of it. The yeah, fact that I've given it not commission away, uh, given it not premium away as a commission, you and hate to sort of. Not get it back that's you, right, absolutely yeah, right. But um, it took me six years to unwind it, to get my money out. And as you'd expect, the insurer didn't make it easy for me to get my money back, which you know, sure irritated sure. me further. Yeah. So one day I'll have a good chat with Hirda about how um, how insurers <laughs> deal with customers. Yeah. And I had to persist over three months to get my money out. And obviously after it, by the time I got it out, mm -hmm. our uh, consistent compound methodology, the, the book we spoke about, yeah. was a big part of my life by then. So I immediately plumped the, the savings in there. Mm -hmm. But uh, this, this remains my biggest mistake. I reckon 
mm. I reckon my net worth would be 30% higher if I had, I had I not done the... That's a, that's a huge statement to yeah. even put out there. But I know what you mean. And so, you know, I bought this stock once thinking that it's this, you know, firecracker. <laughs> and right. I remember uh, the value went down. Like, I think maybe I had 10% left, but I was still not willing right. to, like, sell right. it, you know. And so, selling what, admit. what that highlights to all of us is, each of us will have a domain of competence, right? Uh, clearly, my domain of competence is stock picking. Right. My domain of competence is not analyzing packaged financial products, right? Mm. And mm. If, if I start investing in packaged financial products, I'm more likely than not to make a mistake. Mm. If I stick to what I know best, which is mm. investing in stocks, mm. I'll be all right. Mm. Now, somebody out there mm. might say my domain of competence is just reducing risk, investing heavily in tax free government bonds, and in tracker funds and I think that's all right. I think what we should all be wary of is letting the intermediation yes. profession convince us let me inter- that, yeah, convince us that their wisdom is somehow going to benefit us. I think that construct in Indian wealth management still hasn't reached where the intermediary's wisdom mm-hmm. can actually benefit their consumer. Okay, tell me a little bit more about your own uh, this thing. Now you've started Marcellus. Mm-hmm. How long has it been? It's been about a year. Yeah, we started plus. a year ago. We started managing money 11 months ago. Okay, great. So this is all in the equity market mm-hmm. and it's your own business. So mm-hmm. obviously you've taken some risk mm-hmm. over here with your capital, etc. Sure. Does that make you more conservative in your personal finance? So, so I think I'm following the same mantra that I've followed uh, in my post ULIP. Right. The fun mantra is that whatever I need for the next three years mm-hmm. to finance my lifestyle, mm-hmm. whatever I need for the next three years to finance my lifestyle, I put that in low risk or no risk investments. So right. FDs, government bonds for the next three years of outgo. So if something happens to me at any point in time, the family uh, or myself mm-hmm. should have three years to live on, on the back of whatever I've, I've set aside. Uh, and everything else is the risk on piece where, where I'm willing to uh, invest in uh, equities. Uh, most of our, uh, the equity investments are are in the consistent compound of coffee can mode. Mm-hmm. Some of them are uh, are in small caps, and in, in that book, uh, in that book, coffee can investing, we've espoused a small cap ideology, uh, right. which I follow myself, which is choose really high quality niche uh, niche companies right. dominating specific areas of Indian economy with strong cash flows, clean accounting. So, so I set aside three years of money, which is to be risk free. The rest of it, I divide 75, 25. 75 goes into the Asian page, JDFC bank type right. stocks, which form the heart of our portfolio. And 25% goes into these uh, champion smaller franchises. Um, so that's, that's, that's my mantra since my ULIP trauma. I think you are one of those rare people who's managed to kind of, um, you know, have this complementary uh, relationship with money on the professional and personal. Yeah, uh, that, that's been a conscious attempt actually. Yes. That's been a conscious attempt because I realized that that um, that you got to think for yourself is of your money. Nobody else mm-hmm. is going to rent their brain to you mm-hmm. to get help you get rich, right? Mm-hmm. As I said, we tried with that financial advisor. And, and um, you know, as, and, and if, you, if you read my book, Coffee Can Investing, mm-hmm. you'll see a lot of skepticism yes. vis-a-vis the intermediation profession. So, yes. so you like the It that. does work for some people though. I, I um, think because you're already out there and you're... You my record is the, the registered investment advisor construct. The mm-hmm. RIA construct has a lot going for it. Right. Where uh, the client pays a fixed fee uh, mm-hmm. to the intermediary to access the intermediary's uh, wisdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the con- conventional maybe uh, the wealth, distributor intermediary yeah, the, the, yeah, the wealth manager so. which is yeah. basically same as yeah. distributor in our country mm-hmm. there is an inherent conflict of interest at the heart sure. of that relationship um, and that's where I think the challenges arise mm-hmm. remember um, uh, it is expensive there, there is an opportunity cost for the wealth manager slash distributor to serve you he or she is spending time with you mm-hmm. the only way he or she can recover that is by the manufacturer paying them a commission so the sooner the intermediation industry moves away from commission driven constructs, mm-hmm. the more likely it is that the intermediation industry can be used of use to people like you. Sure, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, so also the, you know, uh, that's right, the commission moves away and the intent then becomes very clear on what mm-hmm. the objective you're trying to achieve. Uh, hopefully advisors do bring in some uh, kind of um, benefit to people who are not from the financial services industry. Absolutely, and, they, they can, but I think the advisory profession needs to rethink the cost structures. Right. The current uh, wealth management cost structures 
uh, are unviable. I can't see how you can have you know, glass offices uh, in the middle of Bombay. <laughs> I know you're uh, working on something related to this, but we're go I'm going to stop you and we're right. going to move away from this right. because it's so easy to get into, uh, right. you know, uh, this discussion. I want to know a little bit more about your uh, money philosophy. You know, over the years, you've, uh, like you said, made a conscious attempt yeah. uh, to uh, sort of think about what yeah. money can do for you. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, has it changed from the time that you were so keenly spending on your travel savings for your travel to now? I think I think the the I think our spending habits, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. our spending habits I think are very hard to change. So if someone spends on say handbags and designer clothes and fancy restaurants, I think it's very difficult to tell that person no, don't do that. That's part of his or her personality. Where I think um, we, we evolve is our conviction levels in how to invest change, right? And in my case, as I've grown older, I've realized the simpler you keep it, the better off you are, okay. right? So your risk freeze to government bonds and FDs, mm -hmm. your risk freeze, and for your risk up where you want a decent return, do high quality stock investment, right? So when I was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. I would have said, well, maybe a ULIP, maybe an actively managed right. mutual fund, maybe long short, maybe structured products. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you realize it doesn't work. You just have to keep it super simple. Do a part which is where your business conservative, your rainy day corpus, your next three year corpus or five year plan. And then do a part where you need the compounding to fire and right. do a high quality stock investing. I think everything else is redundant. The simpler you keep it, the more likely it will work for you. And would you define your um, sort of relationship with money as being positive? Or are you still working on it to get I think there? my relationship money because money is similar to my relationship with reading and travel. It's part of my life, right? right. Partly because I manage money for 700 other people. Right. And partly because I realize that in a country like ours, there is no social security network. Mm -hmm. uh, our yeah, savings, to create our absolutely, our yeah. savings are as, as essential as our, say, the house we live in. Mm -hmm. You can't sort of see it as a, as a chore. Mm -hmm. It is like breathing. If you're not managing money, like you're going to the gym or like you're you know, uh, having dinner with your family, as a routine course of life, mm -hmm. it gets very tough. See, the more, as soon as money becomes a, an extra add-on or a chore, mm -hmm. you're then, your brain is not thinking about it rationally. Mm -hmm. Your brain is not going to think about it. You're going to see it as a one-off activity, which you'll forget about and move on. If you see it like that, it'll come and bite you in the backside okay. uh, when you least need it to bite you. So, so you, we could have, all of us have to work on it, just as yeah. we have to sort of you know wake up in the morning and, and you know, have to work on our family lives and, and, yeah. and work on our fitness and our diet. I think money is going to be just like that, a routine part of our lives. Yeah. Well, that's excellent. So you heard, Saurabh, uh, keep it simple, simpler the better when it comes to money and make it a part of your life. Don't overthink it, don't underthink it for sure. Uh, keep at it every day, make a conscious effort and uh, build that uh, security that money gives you for all your years to come. Thank you so I much, Saurabh, like for sharing all those inputs. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening in. And as you heard, Saurabh, there are mistakes that we all make in our money lives, but there's no better time to fix them than right now and move ahead with your money relationship in the most positive manner possible. Keep watching in for other episodes of this series and do log into moneypuzzle.in for all your personal finance queries. Thank you.